morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. I uh, want to welcome everybody to today's Public Works Committee uh, meeting, Wednesday, January the 25th. Uh, roll call, Ms. Kern. Councilmember Thomas. Present. Councilmember Jeruso. Councilmember Harris. Here. Councilmember King. Councilmember Green. We do not have a quorum. We, we don't have a quorum, but let's start the meeting as a uh, informational meeting until, uh, especially to respect the time of uh, the people who've come to testify or talk about the issue, issues on the agenda. So first item on the agenda, please. So we'll skip over the approval of the minutes Absolutely. and go to um, Department of Sanitation with the discussion and update on curbside collections for service areas one and two, and on the current trash and recycling collections contract. And something uh, we have in uh, an amendment to talk about street lighting also. So that that's, if it's not on the agenda, I'm going to make it an agenda item. Uh, Council Member Thomas, we've got uh, Sarah McLaughlin Porter. She's going to brief you out on all those. We've got elements. an MVP, Miss Sarah, over there. Yeah. So Sorry, she's that. always prepared to deal with everything, anything. Uh, not, not to belabor this meeting, uh, guys, if you can start your presentation, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, Council Member Thomas, uh, Council Member Harris, uh, thank you for letting, giving us the opportunity to brief this morning on our sanitation uh, situation. I, I would say up front before uh, you know I take any questions that you know I just appreciate your support that I get from the council and funding uh, to be able to uh, you know improve the conditions for the residents and service out in, in the neighborhoods. Uh, we've been working very hard right now on the Richards contract uh, negotiations, as you know. I was hoping they would be here this morning, but we can answer it. Uh, I've got Matt Torrey here, the, the Director of Sanitation, to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Torrey. Hey, good morning. So as Joe said, certainly uh, happy to answer any questions. I think probably just the, the quick update from the last time that we're here uh the city you know took steps to to bring in some additional resources to help uh supplement and sure up uh service area one those supplemental uh crews hit the ground on january 10th so it's been two weeks now i think it we've all seen a stabilization of collections uh, as as related to where they were uh, around the holidays which was, I'm sure, great news. I know council offices have seen a significant reduction in complaints, which I'm, I know is welcome. Um, but as Joe has alluded to, you know, the city is continuing to have an ongoing dialogue and, and with, with Richards around our Get Well plan to help uh, going forward on a long-term basis to have uh, the resources in place uh, within Richards to provide the, the daily collection of solid waste and recycling going forward. So. Well, I know three of my colleagues signed a letter, uh, uh, especially, I mean, highlighting this service area. Councilmember Harris. Thank you, uh, Chair Thomas. Um, I have several questions, but I do want to say, Matt, uh, we echo what you're seeing. Um, since the supplemental trash companies have been um, helping Richards out, I can tell you that the week of Thursday, January 3rd through January 6th, we had 128 missed trash pickups, but that declined to last week, only 11 reported trash pickups. So we can see that there's been an, a, a decrease in reported trash and recycling pickups. Um, do you have 311 data that shows you how many more are out there? We get calls, of course, but 311 also gets calls. Yeah, I can I can talk about the data that we saw uh, from leading from the holidays to to last week. So we really hit a peak right after New Year's. I had over close to twenty seven hundred missed collection complaints in service area one. The week after that, the week of January 9th, we went down to fifteen hundred. Last week we were at two hundred. Okay. So we've seen a dramatic decrease in in complaints, which I know your office certainly has. Uh, personally felt and I'm sure appreciates like we do. Yeah, no, I, Matt, the trash man uh, <laughs> of my office is, is no longer that. He he has other things to take care of. So I, I really appreciate it. How much longer will the supplemental trash pickup continue? 
we, we plan to continue to uh, keep supplemental resources in place until um, we're able to have a corresponding uh, swap out of Richard's resources. So, so until we're, you know, we want to maintain that level of stability and confidence in collections. So we don't plan on removing them until we're confident that uh, those similar resources are available on the Richard side. Okay. Um, I want to turn to uh, backlogs of trash and recycling cart replacement. I know that is an issue. Can you tell us what the current backlog is and what the plans are to um, get replacement cans out to folks? Yeah, uh, th this is a you know an item that are have been a part of our conversations um, with Richards for Service Area One. The I don't have the the precise number in front of me, and I'll be happy to to get that to you. But it's it's certain the backlog at last check was uh, uh, over a thousand. It might have been over two thousand uh, at, at that point. So significant a significant number there. Um, certainly, residents need uh, functioning trash carts to be able to properly contain debris and put it out. So, I mean, again, it's one of the items that we're working with to help to help get the resources in place so that Richards can resume uh, getting those carts out within the SLAs of the contract. Yeah, I mean, I, I was at some neighborhood meetings this past couple of weeks and people were asking whether they should be purchasing their own trash uh, cart and putting it out. I told them no, um, but what's your thought on that? I mean, obviously that's not ideal. I mean, we certainly, we residents pay for a service and a part of that service is the card and we would expect that to happen. Now, I certainly know that residents have taken it upon themselves to to go and buy a, a collection card to be able to contain their debris because they're dealing with uh, animals and rodents tearing apart tearing apart their bags. And, and we certainly apologize for that inconvenience um, and are trying to do everything we can to get carts out in a timely manner. And just to clarify, if somebody does do self-help by by getting a card and and putting it in place. Richards or the supplemental trash collectors will pick that up. Is that correct? Or they yeah, should? Absolutely. As well as bags. You know, if, if they don't have a cart and they place out bags, curbside, those bags should be getting collected. Great. I want to turn to the issue of Christmas trees. I know people still have Christmas trees, even though it's going into Mardi Gras. Tell me what is the status or plans to pick up any additional Christmas trees? Are there any plans in place? Uh, I mean They'll, they'll certainly be picked up. Uh, unfortunately, we had our we have our designated period every year. Uh, we're citywide. We do Christmas tree collections. So that was the week of January 9th through the 14th. During that time, we have uh, contractors in place that do intake at our staging location. They receive, bundle the Christmas trees and get them ready for the National Guard to drop them in the spring. So we, we certainly are aware that some trees did not get picked up during that designated period. I know that a uh, uh, Richards has been running trucks and collecting, at least has been reporting that they're collecting some trees and staging them at their yard and that they're going to transport them at a designated time to the staging area. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly we we do see some, not a lot, but some trees still down actually throughout neighborhoods that we're working to get picked up. Okay. No, that's good news. Cause my, what we're hearing is that Richards, Richards are the supplemental pickup parties are just trashing them rather than staging them for coastal restoration. I know that's a, a big deal for a lot of people. Um, Glass Half Full also apparently is recycling Christmas trees. Is there any plans to work with Glass Half Full or get them Christmas trees? Can we do that as a city? We, I mean, we we have a, a, a partnership with Glass Half Full on Glass now. So happy to to talk with Fran and team about what they're doing. I'll be honest with you, I'm not I'm not very familiar. But from our perspective, we, you know, we bundle our trees and we have this partnership with the National Guard to drop them in Bayou Sauvage. So we'll find out what they're doing with their trees and if there's any synergies, you know, that we can do do there. But I mean, we certainly, I mean, I applaud them. I mean, they're a wonderful organization. And for them to to add Christmas trees to the repertoire, that's impressive. Yeah, and Council Member Harris, I think that was part of, I don't think Matt saw the exchange of emails between myself and Richard's uh, council. But that's part of our ongoing negotiation was Christmas trees. I forwarded the information on glass half full right. so they could work with them. But that's that's part of the package we're working on right now. Okay. Well, why don't we end with a good story? Why don't you tell us about the glass partnership with glass half full? Because that's something that I, I'm, I know we introduced them to y'all. I'm very excited about them because I think they're a fabulous um, organization here in New Orleans. Yeah. So, so since, uh, the, the council kind of reconnected us with Glass Half Full. We've been continuing to work with their leadership team on how can we um, align what we do at our weekly drop off at Elysian Fields and what they do um, through their their uh, their entity. Obviously, we both collect glass. We both have the same objective in trying to 
um, recycle as much glass as possible. And, and we're very much fans of where, what they do with their glass, as far as the output of it. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do with recycled glass. And I think theirs is unique specific to our region. So we've been partnering with them, um, really to now divert the glass that we collect on a weekly basis at our drop-off, which is significant, uh, to their operations so that it can be processed for the, with their, with their output. Great. And I know that they also pick up glass. So if anybody drinks a lot of wine or has a lot of beer bottles or whatever, um, you can actually pay them to come pick up glass. I think it's like $25 per cart. All right. That's all I have. I think it's great that we're working with Richards, uh, trying to, of course, boy, um, a, an African American owned business. Um, and it's great for our constituents that trash and recycling is actually being picked up. So thank you. Yeah, and I think, uh, Council Member, I think we're going down the right road. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, feeling good about the negotiations going on. I know that we, we've got a uh, went back and forth for a day, and and came into agreement on Monday, on a package uh, to get well. And I think the funding provided back to uh, Richard's disposal helped them bring up to a level. Uh, and also, I think what I can say is that moving forward, uh, we'll just see how the performance is. Uh, goals uh, for the residents and it, and it will for me it'll make a decision whether we actually move forward with an RFP uh, to put out on the street but we definitely want to give them a shot okay. uh, to come back I mean they they were uh, providing good service before COVID and and uh, Hurricane Ida so I want to give them a chance to uh, excel to the end of the term of the contract I, I, I want I want to stay there uh, I said when we first started to deal with the garbage issue. Uh, I don't know if everybody remembers, I said, well, especially these two major contracts uh, that were awarded to African-American businesses some time ago, it was, it was more than just them having a contract. I think it was two of the largest awards uh, in, in this country uh, ever for people who collect garbage or do solid waste disposal. So my question was then, if they weren't good enough or if they couldn't do the service and citizens just want their garbage pick up, picked up, they don't care if people from Mars do it or Pluto or, or from the lower ninth ward, they just want their garbage picked up. But it was so significant that with these contracts represent, rep represented in terms of history, right? Uh, Mr. Torr, you know the history of garbage collection. It was around 1890, 1895 when New York formally said, you know, Americans and people in the city were amassing so much garbage, we needed something formal. Mm -hmm. In the 1930s, it changed to solid waste disposal. You know, the garbage industry hadn't developed as a business model, it had developed as a need model. Mm -hmm. So in the 1930s, they said they needed something more formal, more organized that represented some structure of business. Well, African-Americans had not participated at all other than folk on the back of the truck, hoppers, and in not too distant future, uh, those who could actually drive the trucks. So the basis of the question that I asked was that, if these two black contractors weren't good enough, then what did we do to replace a multi-million dollar hole in the African-American business community? Not saying that we wanna give someone a contract just because they're black, but just because they represent a moment in history, but especially given uh, the, 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 the financial statistics in our community, you know, our Hispanic brothers and sisters haven't been here that long, but they doubled in per capita income our community. Since Katrina, they doubled our per capita income. Our Asian brothers and sisters are on par with household earnings for whites. So there's still that, that gap, that finance, that capital, that economic gap in, in the black community. So then my question was, if it can't be this or these contractors based on performance and their inability to do the work, how do we begin to take a look at that hole, that financial hole, that, that economic hole that's in, that's in a community that has the greatest disparity? Now, some folk may not think it's their job to take a look at that, but if you look at crime, if you look at economic uh, instability, if you look at gentrification, if you look at housing, if you look at people being pushed to the edges of this community, if we're, if we're not mindful of the economics for every community, 
then we will never close that gap. And those other issues won't be impacted. So to Mr. Tory and uh, to Mr. Threat, thank you for how you presented this morning because you guys presented this in a way is that you're mindful of that business, you're mindful of the inequities, and if there's a chance to fix it, if there's a chance to make it right, then you understand the significance, the historical significance, as well as the economic significance of for the first time in history. And um, that, you know, I went back to 1880, right? So you have a community that's left out of the business side of that. And this is 2020s. So I think what they said this morning, Councilmember Harris, uh, Councilmember King, uh, who's been pushing for a level of inclusion and participation, is that you're mindful of the fact that it's more than just about picking, picking up trash. It's about how do we impact and close the gaps and the disparities. Specifically, everybody's afraid to say black business, black folk, black this, black that. It's not, when folk, when, we're not trying to just to not include anybody else when we do that. It's not anything against any other community when we do that. It's being mindful of the history of this community and who's been left out of the economics in this community. And let me tell you what some folk don't know, who get upset when they hear Black leaders, Black advocates, Black business people talk specifically about the impact of Black business and Black economics. If Black business and Black economics is on the bottom, if our economics and finances are raised up, what happens to everybody else, Dr. King? Mm -hmm. So, so we, 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 you know, you know, people can't get sensitive about saying help the bottom because what we know in this country, especially in the age of disaster capitalism, the bottom just lifts up the top, right? And you hope at some point there's a foundation of, of stability. Now, the last thing that I wanna say on this issue is, we've talked about the history of garbage collection, right? 1890, New York's first formal contracts transforming into solid waste in the 1930s. There's been a system of collection <laughs> since then. Mm -hmm. So why are we not more organized? Now, you have zones, you have areas. New York City did when they started it. We did when we started it. You, you, people amass trash. There's a collection bin. You put it out, folk pick it up. What went wrong? So we evolved from trash collection to not collecting trash or to missing, to, to missing trash to be collected. I don't understand that. Have the companies, are they that disorganized? Do we not have a standard in house to talk about how trash should be collected, especially in certain zones, the kind of trash, the kind of solid waste disposal? What went wrong? What did we miss? Because even if there's a disparity, and even if a company is stretched to be able to collect the trash, and even if the contracts are unfair, there's still trash out of house, trash in a bin, trash put out, trash to be collected. Mr. Torre, what, what did we miss? I guess looking, looking back, um, as you alluded to, I mean, you have you have to have resources in order to do work to start with, but but once you when you're doing the work, you have to have a way to track the work, your the performance you're doing, and I think what we've learned over time is you know we need to introduce more levels of accountability and performance to these these things. Um, so with the most recent contracts that we've done, you saw that we introduced new forms of performance measures and tracking, largely in the form of GPS and reporting. So now on a daily basis for our new contracts, so the service providers in service area two and three, the service at your council district, at the end of each day, those contractors have to provide a map showing a GPS report, literally showing where the truck went and which roads it went down and which roads it didn't went down. If it didn't, if a truck didn't go down a road, say it was blocked off because of road construction or something was going on there, they have to state why and what measure, you know, what action they took to uh, medi remediate that. Um, but we can literally see at the end of the day, which streets trucks didn't go down and know, did they collect or did they not collect and what's, what's to happen. So that's different than in the past 
we know that at the end of every day now, um, whether all routes were completed, if they weren't, why they weren't, and what action is going to be taken. So that allows us on a daily basis now to have that check and balance to say yes. And I know, you know, we've, there have been a couple times uh, in your service area where something's happened where we haven't been able to complete collections. And we've been able to tell you that yes. night, hey, we didn't complete collections in this area. We're coming back tomorrow morning. Then the next day we circle back. Yep, we got it. So I think it's about having the tools and resources to be able to efficiently track um, the work that you're doing. I mean, the work that you think about solid waste and people think it's simple, like you said, you, you pick up trash, but it's not that simple. We have 150,000 households across four sanitation districts in the city that receive trash and recycling collection on a daily basis. That's a lot of work. I mean, on any given day, you have uh, you know 50 to 60 trucks picking up solid waste and recycling. So to track that, to make sure that you have the resources that come to work every day, ready to operate that equipment, ready to be on the back of that equipment in the weather conditions that we deal with. I mean, it's complicated. It's a lot that goes on. So having having the data and the, the performance accountability measures to allow us to have that transparency, I think it changes, changes everything. Uh, Mr. Torr, you've been stellar in terms of uh, responding and, and doing the work. We see uh, how it's made a difference. I think Joe Threat has given us some faith that a, uh, a street that started to be paved four, three years ago will finally be finished. Uh, I, I don't know if people believed it until you came along, uh, Mr. Threat. But, okay, you know, I'm smart enough to know I don't know everything. And I listen to people and I like to drive around and I, and I like I, I like recalling history. Like to, to me, you know, folk may not want to deal with people who've been around or, you know, it's time for something new. But recalling history and what those things that used to happen, to me, that's that's my foundation for being here, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember when they had inspectors and departments who would keep track of work. So what about if we had a spotter who was 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 responsible, right, who answered to you, who work certain zones who could say, hey, hold on, uh, Mr. $18 million a, a year contractor, you miss these three houses. And this is our plan for when you miss a house, how you go back and recover the garbage for that house. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Threat, as, as, I, as I thought about the debacle on Napoleon when they did the, uh, the overlay after they did the main, major drainage project, it was major news when we found out that the contractor was paving over the drains. Mm -hmm. Well, if there was someone from public works, or from infrastructure, who when that contractor was finishing that work, who was, who was going over and looking at the overlay and saying, hey, hold on a second, guess what you're doing, Mr. $50 million sealer project contractor? Mm -hmm. You're covering up the drains. I know you covered this one, but so you don't cover up anymore, be mindful that these drains are, are the reason why we did this big seal of drainage project. I think maybe in the midst of these multi-million dollar contractors, maybe some of it ought to be to make sure that we have people that work within you guys' departments who not only monitor these contracts, but daily go out and assess these contracts so that the crawfish isn't missed and the drain isn't covered. And you know what, Council Member Thomas, believe it or not, we have those people now. Well, yeah, but that's we're talking about a, we're talking about accountability. And, and that's why I'm out there. We have resident inspectors, we have construction administration, people that we pay good dollars to do these inspection processes. And that's why you see me out there right now, it's just holding people accountable. Uh, if I could, just to go back to but it something. it be like the Hard Rock inspection. No. Uh, and, and going back to your other point about uh, what could we have done better, I mean, for a contract, it's very seldom in the federal government where you see a contract for seven years. You only see those in NASA when they're building uh, rockets to the moon or Mars. But for a seven-year contract, when I look at it, and after talking to Richard's disposal, it should be some element of contract language to let us every year annually to renegotiate pricing as we move forward. I, I, I just think that, especially in light of where we are now, and Council Member Green is going to be next, you know, I, I've been sitting on this, right, just kind of watching and 
appreciate the work that 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 you guys do. It's not just this company working for the city having a contract. It, it, we have to have the ability to help that contractor do the best they can with the people's tax dollars. Yes, our at, at the end of the day, right? You know that contract may specifically say one thing. But Mr. Tory, too often you're out covering up for what somebody else didn't do. Well, there has to be a built-in mechanism that we're not just always covering up or going behind what they do, but it's actually making sure they do what they're paid to do. Councilmember Green. Mr. Tory, I'd like to start off as I've done before with thanking you and some sanitation for those cleanups that you do in District D. Um, I drive the district regularly and we make requests and you get it done. I look forward to the day and it's gonna happen before too long where we stop people from going back to the sites where you cleaned up and just illegally dumping. But um, there's something that we're working on right now with the Department of Safety and Permits that's gonna help in that regard. I had a general comment. Um, no matter how large a contractor you are in terms of construction with the city of New Orleans, you have the ability that if something changes or if you find something that wasn't right, that you can put in a change order. And a lot of contractors count on doing business with the city because they're gonna be able to turn in a change order if they pull up the street and they find pipes that were damaged that they didn't know about. I suggest to you that with a seven year contract, um, whatever it might be, whatever the term would be, but flexibility and change right. and change orders are important. In um, the case of Richard's disposal and Metro disposal, both contractors were subjected to the, the problems and ramifications relative to COVID. Um, certainly inflation affected their contracts. Um, the city required that they pay wages that were higher than when the contract started seven years ago. All of those things to me that if I were a contractor, a construction contractor, I think that I could put that in a change order. And I know that you said you're going to review it every year. That's a good idea. That is something that came out of our discussions with the council. But I'd like you to think about the change order process as we go through the contract and think about what could be done to put a trash and garbage collection firm on the same footing as a multi-million dollar contractor who finds something that they didn't expect. And I think we have that in place because that's how we keep construction jobs going, as opposed to, I can't do it anymore. I'm not gonna get the job done. We give the option to change order because we want people to bid on it, but also we want them to stay on the job. As we move forward with whatever we're gonna do relative to Richards, including in, in your discussions right now, um, you strongly have my support and I know members of the council to treat it as seven years ago, things were incredibly different then than are now relative to wages, inflation, and other factors, and that whatever term we call it, a change order may be necessary to be able to get the same service out of a different time period that we exist in now. So um, just keep that in mind as you negotiate with Richards, that I think that you'd find flexibility on the council level, recognizing all of the changes that have taken place. Yes, uh, Councilmember uh, Green, we're going to give uh, the company uh, all the tools they need to be successful. Uh, I want them to get to, through the term of their contract. We've talked about at the end of that term, if, if services is up to par and quality for the residents of New Orleans, that we can talk about, you know, extending that term and without putting a new RFP out. But, uh, you know, I just want to, and when you talked about it, uh, Councilmember Thomas, I mean, when we talk about minority businesses, always ask access to capital and lines of credit and bonding capacity. And we've worked hard uh, with this administration to debundle contracts to give people an opportunity to be successful. And we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have some public comment, Mr. Edward Parker, followed by Ms. Aisha Kelly, then Mr. Terrence Neely. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Edward Come Parker, on. 7802 Henley Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70126. And uh, this has to do mainly with our two minority or Black contractors. 
we just had a uh, crime summit. And one of the tenets of our crime summit is the city's own disparity study. And the city's current disparity study that was done maybe about two, three years ago talks about the problems we have in our black community with black contractors. This city lets out so many dollars worth of contracts and our black community only gets so little or so few of those funds back into our community. Richards and Metro are two of our main minority uh, no, our main black contractors. And it would be a travesty for a city that's 60% black to lose two of our black vendors who are our major black vendors in this city. We cannot have this. Now, as far as I can understand, and I stand corrected. They only got those contracts because they were low bid contracts. Am I right? Low bid contracts, as opposed to what is it, the RFPs that is a different type of contract than low bid. So if Richards and Metro had not been low bid uh, 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 contractors, they wouldn't have even had that. And they have been doing this for what? Over better than 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. They have been giving the city more bang for their buck Thank you, Mr. Farr. than we've ever had. Thank you. Thank you. At some point, the the city will visit the uh, uh, most responsible uh, versus low. Uh, the one thing we're starting to realize is with a lot of these low bids, uh, it's been low. Instead of making sure that we can get the most, Jim Singleton taught me a long time ago with street projects, it said, we'll do six blocks of street with, with an asphalt overlay and cover up the cracks instead of doing three blocks of curb and gutter and replacing the utility and making sure you got three blocks that'll last for decades until you get the other money to do the other three that'll last for decades. Uh, we got to stop rushing into low bid, which wind up being no work. Uh, next, we have Mr. Neely and then Ms. Kelly. Um, uh, either Ms. Kelly, you can go. He yields to the lady. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Aisha Kelly. I am a resident of District E, and I'm also a member of the New Orleans East Task Force, where I focus on illegal dumping and community blight. And um, first, I would like to start by saying that um, the Department of Sanitation and Matt has been stellar in their communications that I've sent, always effective, always with a response and with a solution, and I truly appreciate that. I do think the magical word here is stability. We, we talk, When we talk about stabilization, when we talk about the new trash contractor, I do know that when my daughter and I are loading our laptops and our dance bags into the car on a Tuesday morning, that my trash guy is going to be passing or he is already passed or he's en route. Um, so I think stabilization is a big word here. I think that um, we've, we are definitely making strides within the district. It is looking cleaner. I would like to see, and I think my question here is what do we have in place when we talk about bulk items, right? Because we're seeing a large amount of illegal dumping in our district. Um, so my question is, I know that we do the 311 request, but what about those citizens who are not aware of the 311 request? Um, you know, they say don't come with a problem without a solution. My solution to this and my ask would be 
for you all to take into consideration the possibility, the possibility of some type of educational, um, we need to recondition the minds of our citizens that you don't have to load that mattress and that sofa to the back of your truck and drop it next door to my house. You can literally put it to the curb and submit a 311 and somebody, somebody will take your bulk item away. So my question to the city council and to Mr. Tory is, what is the next steps? Yeah, we're talking about stability. We love stability. Next question is, let's talk about bulk waste. Let's talk about illegal dumping because it is definitely plaguing in our community and we'd love to see something happen within um, a citywide um, initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Mr. Tory, bulk, bulk so, items. Yep. So. Uh, bulk items as part of uh, all city contracts, but specifically for uh, service area three where, where Waste Pro is operating, right? So that these new contracts, we introduced new types of equipment to be able to pick up all items that come, come curbside for your eligible bulky items. So residents are able to place up to 10 cubic yards of, of waste, uh, bulky items curbside on their collection day that can run the gamut from bagged vegetative debris, furniture, mattresses, sofas, tables, chairs, uh, appliances, refrigerators, stoves, dishwashers, and even e-waste and tires, so televisions and up to four tires. Um, we run different types of equipment now, so you have your regular garbage truck picking up your cart, but we also have the uh, flatbed as well as the clamshell trucks picking up those large items. Um, as was, was alluded to, what really helps the city's contractors route trucks is to submit a 311 request that notifies us of what type of debris it is because a different truck will pick it up. Tires go on flatbed trucks, the clamshell trucks pick up those mattresses and equipment or, uh, or furniture, and your regular garbage gets picked up by that. But to, to the point around education, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, certainly, um, the city has not really led the way on public information campaigns, education campaigns. It's been something that's been lacking in the past. Um, and I think I would be a strong supporter of trying to get direct information out to residents or reminding them about how to properly contain and get their debris disposed of because we do have the resources in place. And I think those resources are picking up the items, but uh, there, there seems to be a little disconnect, uh, certainly on awareness with residents. Right. And I think to just to add uh, Council Member Thomas to what Matt said, that's sanitation. It is an effort, and and Councilmember King knows that in the uh, ARP dollars, we committed a, a a chunk of money toward code enforcement and illegal dumping. Uh, I I'm pleased to say that uh, just yesterday I I signed a request for information on uh, abandoned scrap tires uh, that went to purchasing. So I'm looking and I'm hoping to get some some good ideas from a market survey out of industry that deal with scrap tires to come down and give us some support so we can put an RFP out for that. Uh, guys, you know, I've been uh, following people. You know, I posted the Pennsylvania license plates and the Tennessee license plates of people with big vehicles with tires in them uh, and trash. Uh, I followed somebody from Mishu to downtown to uh, the Treme area, I think they figured out, I, I realized I can't follow them in a government car because they, they, they made me. So it's evidently they were on the lookout and I had to go to a meeting. So I couldn't continue to follow him to see where he was gonna bring his trash. But we did get some information on someone who was dumping. They have a, a history of, of uh, uh, in Florida, going to jail for illegal dumping. They have a history of other states for illegal dumping. And guess where they're dumping now? They're dumping here. So the issue was when we followed that trail, now, you know, I, I'm supposed to be the councilman. I don't think I'm supposed to be the, as a matter of fact, we do, you know, the, the, the job of a councilman in the charter is land use, zoning, Budgeting and appropriate. That's, that's really the job, not administrative stuff, but we do it because we work with our city. So the issue was once we identified this person, who do we go to to go, especially with pictures and license plates? Who do we go to to send somebody out to say, hey, Mr. Dumper from Florida to Louisiana, 
We got you. What's that next step? I, I, if we got how, how do we perp walk them? I mean, if we've got information, uh, Council Member Thomas with license plates or some type. Oh, I no, we got, yeah, I'm got going it. to NOPD. Yeah, we got it. Yes. Yeah, I want him to be able to stand up and say, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? Mm -hmm. Isn't this you? So get it to you. Yes. Okay. All right. Got it. Got pictures, ID, rest history, everything consistently driving through states, driving through parishes to dump here. Mm -hmm. Habitual. In, the, in their arrest history, not carjacker, not house burglar, illegal dumper. Councilman Green. Adding to that story, um, let me just make it clear that in District D, especially under the elevated expressways, the dumping is done by people who are already paid and they're supposed to be taking it to the right place. Just recently, a vehicle that had a sign on the side of it saying we will dispose of waste was leased in Alabama. Two guys came here to the city. We will dispose, the of it, dispose of it on your sidewalk. That's right. We will dispose of it under the interstate. And so the interesting thing is, is that, and I want to applaud the police, public work, sanitation didn't have to get involved for this reason. Our office got a message from a citizen. We went out there and saw the debris, but we also saw the video of the citizen. It was two people who had leased a vehicle in Alabama who were dumping under the interstate. Now, to, to the credit, the police actually did um, come out, but the most important thing was that Public Works called the company that the vehicle was being leased from and said, we have an opportunity to take your vehicle if you don't take care of this situation. You know, interestingly enough, Councilman Thomas, they went back and picked up the trash and put it back in their vehicle so that they wouldn't get their vehicle seed. At the end of the day, much of this illegal dumping is done by people who are paid to do it. And they're either one too lazy or just so, just so irresponsible and so in contempt of our communities that they think that they can just make money by just dumping at night in places that are dark, in places that are in low to moderate income areas. We do have to change that and in time we will change that, but the, the um, Department of Safety and Permits is coming up with a set of ru rules because now we need to begin enforcing that seizure of the vehicles. But it's actually something that is on the books. It's hard to enforce because you have to have a police officer actually write the citation. Absolutely. But to those who illegally dump, they need to understand that we recognize that it's a tremendous problem and that you're illegally dumping things that you have been paid to take away. And that's just unconscionable in our community. The, the only thing I'll differ with your counselor is that they don't wait till nighttime anymore. Yeah, right. That's right. No, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, and, 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 in fact, uh, and in fact, yeah, I'll say that wait because night. the picture that we took, interesting enough, the yeah. citizen took was during the yeah. day. By the time we got there, you know, it was right at right at nightfall. But you're right. It's just that bold. They think yeah. that nobody's going to say anything. And I think I encourage citizens more to, if you see something, send it to 311. They'll get it to us. I'm paranoid. Every time I see somebody with a truck with some <laughs> stuff in it. Right. I'm tripping, right? And the, and the citizens are like that. Right. So that's the level of paranoia it is. It ain't just carjacking. It's like car, truck dumping, right? So every time I see a truck, I mean, hey, man, let's, if they got two ties in a basket, a uh, sofa, let's, that person may be moving from one house to the next. But we are so paranoid. Now, I'm serious. I'm, I'm not lying. We're like, let's see if we, so that's the level of, you know, folk think that we paranoid about crime. It's like, man, and you see somebody with a truck. I followed an 18 wheeler one time with a bunch of tires in it. It was delivering it to a store. <laughs> no, no, no. How we say for true? For true. They were, they were actually delivering it to a store. But that's how paranoid we are about this now. Uh, Mr. Mr. Neely. Active enforcement, traversing the interstate is the solution. Good morning. Good morning, Council. Um, Eugene Green, good morning to you. Good morning. Although I don't live in your district, 
Um, I actively reach out to you on behalf of my mother-in-law that resides in your district. Um, sometimes I don't receive a response, but, you know, I would appreciate it if, you know, you can make a conscious effort to try to answer some of my requests to your district. Um, Oliver Thomas, good morning to you. You're doing a phenomenal job, man. We appreciate you. We definitely appreciate you. Your people see you, and uh, we definitely appreciate that. Good morning to you, Freddie King. I haven't met you before, but I, I love what you're doing with the kids. Appreciate you. Good morning to you as well, Mr. Leslie Harris. Um, one thing we didn't we did kind of touch on is tires, right? Um, we've discovered that the enforcement does fall on LDEQ, and I believe that we rely too much on LDEQ for the enforcement of these tires. I had an idea about creating a separate department under sanitation, maybe to start to enforce these tire shops to be in compliance with the race tire process. Um, I know that we're kind of, you know, going into the realm of, um, you know, settling for this once a week contract uh, with sanitation, but I don't know how effective this comment is going to be, but I like to maintain my own grass right at my house. So if my grass grows a half of inch every week and I want to keep it at a certain height, then I would need to collect it or, or cut it at least two, three times a week to keep it at that height, right? So I don't know if that comment is gonna be effective. I mean, we may as well just say that we're gonna be settling for once a week, Mr. Matt, but we definitely need to reconsider going back to twice a week. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Neely. Uh, guys, uh, and we're getting that picture and that license and that information from the person who the, the citizen actually went out of their way to make sure they, you know, to, the people are starting to participate now, man. And and that's, they, they, that's, and that's what we want. That's welcome. Right? That's what we want. But we keep them engaged when they see enforcement and when they see results. Other than that, they, they, they just throw their hands up and they say, we can't make a difference. Right now, people are believing they can make a difference because they're engaged. We got to make sure we lock them in. Anything y'all want to close out, uh, uh, Mr. Torrey? I just appreciate the, the council's uh, support of, of the infrastructure group. You know, I've got a big enchilada I'm I'm working with right now, but I've I've got plenty of support for the council folks on the sites. Uh, I've had support doing this evolution with uh, Richardson, talking to Council Member Jeruso. So just continue to do our work. We've got some motivated people out there, and, and we've got some interested residents that want quality work. And like you said, Council Member uh, Thomas, the low bid. You get what you pay for. Get what you pay for. And uh, best value is, you know, I hope we can get that uh, someday through the state and public bid law. Ms. And Mr. Torrey, thank you for what you do. Uh, you, when a citizen contacts you, uh, you respond. And I wish everybody had that same uh, effort. I, I tell folk who work for the, the public all the time, if you don't like the public and people, you shouldn't work in a job where you have to deal with people. Because if you didn't have people bothering you, you wouldn't have that job. Right. So thank you for what you do, Mr. Tourette. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a uh, quorum now. Yes, sir. Roll call. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we can recognize that um, council members uh, King and Green have joined. Council members <laughs> King and Green are now officially part of the uh, January 25th Public Works meeting. Approval of the minutes from the October 27th meeting. Moved by Council Member Harris. Second by Council Member King. Vote your machines on approval of the, of the minutes. Uh, Council Member Green, vote your machine. Four yeas, no nays, and the minutes are approved. Uh, he's going to bring you that information on the on the dumper. Uh, Ted, bring it down to Mr. Threat so he can see it. Next item on the agenda, yeah. we have um, the joint infrastructure recovery roads projects with a discussion and update on road work activities and street lights. Brody? Yeah, you can take a picture. I'm going to have to go through the academy and get me a badge. I, I know they're not gonna give me a gun again, but I took we gotta get that law changed too. Thank you. 
Yeah, why don't you just text it to him or forward it to him? Okay, all right. Thank you, guys. Uh, Councilmember um, Thomas, we're going to start now with our, our brief and updates on the um, public works. Um, Sarah McLaughlin uh, Porteous, uh, my chief of staff and uh, interim director of DPW, be briefing. Uh, we we have uh, met some milestones uh, since our last meeting. Uh, we are moving with our contracts for street lights, traffic lights. We have folks out there working. Uh, we've got our asphalt crews moving for potholes. I, I've been out three or four times with the asphalt crews with DPW along with the mayor. I think we're going back out again Friday. Uh, so, you know, just to keep my folks motivated and let them know that that it matters and I appreciate the work they, they're doing, let the residents know that I wouldn't do anything that my staff won't do. So we'll continue that process, continue to stay in the field. Uh, like I talked about the RFI for tires is out, the PMO contract is out. Uh, for streets, uh, it's out on the street. I think mid February. February we'll have uh, proposals in uh, for senior program management office to a strategy to move the next waves of funding that billion dollars we have for streets. We still have a pause on new contracts going out and street work. A lot of work you see might right now. Some of our streets are state work, but I've I've asked the contractors who are at capacity with our DB. DBEs. We want to finish the neighborhoods where we have open construction. And once that done, we'll start moving new contracts back on the street. Uh, so with that uh, said, I'd like to turn the briefing over to uh, Sarah Porteous to give you an update on all the elements of the Public Works Department. Well, good morning, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to provide an update on some of what we've been doing in the Department of Public Works. Uh, I'm going to begin with an update on our programs and projects to include the joint infrastructure program. Uh, then I'm going to talk through some of our maintenance activities and maintenance contracts that we have underway, uh, talk about our streetlight repair and maintenance program, and then I will conclude by talking about where we are with our traffic signal repairs. Okay, so as, as Joe mentioned, and as you know, you know, we're continuing to work through challenges in our joint infrastructure program. And so I just wanted to kind of give you a big picture overview of kind of where we've where we've gone since May of 2018. So we've got 88 projects with an estimated value of 865 million that have gone into construction. We have 56 projects that have been completed with an estimated value of 379 million and then 129 projects that have gone into final design with an estimated value of 1 billion. And today we currently have 48 projects, this is just joint infrastructure, in construction with an estimated value of 591 million. And we have 10 projects, at, 10 more projects that are moving towards substantial completion in the next 90 days. And I will go through those um, on a couple of the slides that follow. A couple of other highlights I wanted to make, you know, Joe always talks about continuous improvement in our program. Um, last year, as you know, we began in implementing our task order based contracting. And I do have an example of one of those projects and how it's progressing a little later in the presentation. Um, but as you all know, with a task order based contract, the entire contract is awarded to a contractor, but then we release smaller portions of the work via task orders. Right now, we currently have six contracts that are in construction uh, using this new methodology. We have Dillard A and B, Bayou St. John Fairgrounds Group B. We have two projects on Camp Street. We have our Gardena Street project and then Gentilly Woods Group F. But what we're already seeing uh, are more predictable schedules. We're able to be more accurate in our noticing. It's introducing, I think, a new level of accountability with our contractors and really resulting in fewer complaints and a better overall experience for the residents, which is, of course, um, our goal. And we expect that that trend is going to continue as we wind down more of these projects under the old methodology and, and award newer projects with the new methodology. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention, so we have um, improved our coordination with the industry. I think this has really been critical. So with regular meetings with the AGC and ACEC, um, it's really helping us to kind of talk with them through the issues that we're having and come up with solutions, you know, to some of the challenges we have on the back end that are really impacting, you know, work out in the streets. So I'm really pleased that those relationships are, are continuing to grow. Um, we're continuing, as Joe mentioned, with our twice weekly uh, leadership site visit meetings out in the field. 
Um, we've been doing them in every council district, and, and some of you have, have actually been there to attend, and we, we really, really appreciate your support as we continue to do this. But essentially, it allows us to bring together the entire project team, talk through the issues, and I think most importantly, it allows Joe and I to really stay connected with what's actually happening out on the street. So we're, we're pleased about that. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is our implementation of Procore. I've talked a little bit about this before. We're in the beta testing phase. So Procore is a construction management software. It's already helping us to see efficiencies in terms of how we're managing projects. I'm excited because this is something that Sewage and Water Board is also using, which is really important that our technology aligns as we move forward. Um, but again, it brings a new level of transparency and accountability. We're starting with our task order-based contracts. And our AEs on these projects are also utilizing the software, but basically what it means is that our invoices, our plan changes, and other workflows are going to be digital. So we're moving away from having to wait on, you know, physical packages that have to be passed around and signed. So we're very excited. And just as an example, during a recent site visit, one of the project managers just gave an example of an RFI um, that would typically take a couple of weeks to maybe months to approve. It was approved in two hours using our Procore. Uh, software. So we're we're very excited about the future with that technology. Okay, so this slide shows uh, 10 projects that have been completed since September of last year, um, representing projects in most council districts. So we're very excited about the progress that we've made. And then the next slide uh, shows our 90 day look ahead for projects reaching substantial completion. When I talk about substantial completion, this generally means that the substantial completion walkthrough has taken place with the entire project team. And we've identified, you know, a punch list of items that contractors will continue to work on as we move toward project closeout. But you'll see, you know, this represents projects in every council district, a lot of the ones that have been, um, you know, particularly challenging and, and resulted in a lot of complaints are on this list. So we're very excited that we are, you know, starting to see some project, some progress to residents out in the community. Okay, so this uh, slide shows the Bayou St. John Fairgrounds 7th Ward Group E project. So this is one of our task order based uh, contracts. We're very excited because it's being done by Murphy Pipeline. This is a, a contractor out of Florida. So we do have some new contractors uh, in the community doing some of our projects. And what you see here, uh, and Council Member Green was actually out here when we did a, a demonstration, but this is a methodology that pulls a new pipe into the same place. Um, as the existing pipe remains in place. And what's cool about this is it, it results in um, an excavation on one end of the block and the other end of the block. So they don't have to excavate the entire block to replace the water line of the sewer. So this is gonna cut down significantly on construction time. This project, as an example, they started in November. Um, they've already completed the majority of the utilities throughout the project. And we do expect that it is gonna be completed um, probably about a month or two ahead of schedule. So we're very excited about that. Okay, so I wanted to move into just a little bit of an update on some of our maintenance work that we have going on around the city. Um, so our right-of-way repair contracts, these are basically our maintenance contracts that allow us to do work um, that is beyond the, the capability of our internal maintenance crews. We've had to um, put them out, you know, one at a time. And um, we, the first one that has gone out is our District E contract. It's a $3 million um, contract. Hard Rock Construction is the contractor. It started in October of last year, and they've already completed 12 of the first 18 locations of task orders. And I do, I just want to run through quickly some of those locations just um, for, for residents from District E uh, that are listening today. So the contractor finished at Mishu and Carrera, Drain Point Repair, Concrete Street Repair, Asphalt Street Repair and Curb Repair. They also completed a drain point repair on Chateau Court, 13075 Chateau Court. Uh, Marywood Court at Morrison completed a drain point repair and, and street restoration. Another street repair at 9801 Andover Drive. Uh, Kearney, a drain point repair, Kearney, Maine. Mayo at Lake Forest, concrete street repair. Um, at 6872 Mayo, they did a manhole adjustment, another manhole adjustment at 6850 Mayo, uh, 7530 Farwood at Mayo, concrete street repair, curb repair, manhole adjustment and catch basin repair, Mayo at Lake Forest, concrete street repair, curb repair, manhole adjustment, catch basin repair, and then um, 11041 Lake Forest, concrete street repair. So significant amount of work that's already I, happened. I want to thank the contractor in, in terms of uh, hard rock. Uh, 
uh, they've kind of set a motto when they started and then it finished. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be the, the desire of the mission of every contract, start and finish, not start and almost finish. Yes. Leave a hole, leave a panel, panel leave a sidewalk, leave a curb. So I, I don't know what they're doing so that they're completing these projects, but they're, they're setting a good example. It's a, I mean, it's different because it's a maintenance contract, but once again, they get a task order and they're not going to get additional work yeah, until they get these completed. Maintenance and maintenance. Yes. You know, there's so many unfinished maintenance projects out there, mm -hmm. but at least they're on site until they finish. And that, that's that been that's been a different standard. Thank you all for that. Yeah. So we're, we're excited about that work and, and um, excited to get the other contracts out on the street. So our next is the District A contract that has been awarded. Um, we expect uh, the notice to proceed to be in March. And then Districts B, C, and D uh, will be advertised in February with notice to proceed in May. And I will mention that once we get those contracts awarded, we will come to meet with you. Um, we have a long list of priorities for each of those contracts. And so we want to work with you and just sort of let you know what our sequencing is. And we can make adjustments if need be, if there are things. I, 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 I want to ask something here. And, and, and excuse me, my colleagues, but um, there used to be a time when district council members had their own capital projects budget. I, I know, I don't know. I know that kind of evolved and changed. I, I guess, you know, we started having people elect, well, we, we, district council members used to be involved in capital projects and the district because of the conversations with residents, projects that should have been done. And I would hope that as we do, begin to develop the capital project list, that there's a meeting with each district member, uh, not that they control the capital project budget, because what I'm seeing now is that council member Harris has, uh, is beginning to have a history of projects that were promised but were not done, things that were started but not completed, and where each district council member can say, hey, look, it's like when we saw Council Member King in my district, they did a project that was probably 70%, and on the block next to it, they should have did that because that was like 10%, right? And you went out there. You saw they should have did the, the block up the street, not the street that was holding on pretty good. So the only thing I would say about that, it's looks can be deceiving. So there are times when you can you can look at two streets and maybe one looks great on the surface, but the utilities underneath could be a mess. Well, that's Bourbon Street. I understand that. Yeah. But then you look at a street where the surface is a mess and maybe the utilities underneath are in good condition. And so it's not, you know, that, okay. that's okay. All right. Uh, but that's but just, one thing I would but say. Just sit down with district council. Absolutely. Now. And say, hey, you know, what is what's the community list? This is our list. How does it blend? And I would say that most a lot of the priorities that are on those lists are coming from council offices. But we just want to make sure that we're addressing them in a sequence that matches you know, what you expect. So sorry to much. No, not at all. Um, and then our emergency catch basin contract. Um, so it's a $3.7 million contract, also Hard Rock started uh, last year. They're projected to be complete this spring in April, and they've already completed uh, flushing of uh, 4,000 catch basins, and they've got about another 2,000 to do. And then two other Lakeview alleyway contracts. So we have one maintenance contract uh, has been underway since uh, November of last year. They've already completed three of the nine alleys included. If there was remaining budget, we may add some additional alleyways. Um, and then um, our we just have awarded our Lakeview alleyways pervious pavement. So this is... Um, where the pervious pavement that's going to allow us to hold water in those alleyways. Um, that includes seven out alleyways, and we expect that work will be underway next month. Um, not a maintenance contract, but I had this on here, Max Pave. We've talked about this a lot. So this is where we're investing some bond funds to help sewage and water board with service cuts. Very excited. It's been awarded. Fleming is the contractor pushing for um, notice to proceed. I would like to be next month, but it'll, it could be early March. Um, we're going to have this work organized in zones. We will have information to you so you can see exactly which uh, cuts in each district um, are going to be addressed through the program. Did you? Oh. Yeah, Council Member Harris. To uh, Council Member Thomas's point, I mean, we have service cuts that are aging. I have one on my 
my street, not to be selfish, that literally the road is just falling in. So again, I, I think to get with you to figure out where we can prioritize those cuts in order of age and severity, I think that's going to be critically important. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, if we can get them started in, um, if we can get them started next month, sequence wise, we may have to start in areas that are not going to be impacted by Mardi Gras, but absolutely, we want to address those that have been, you know, the most long standing ones. So we more information to follow and we will have a public facing element so that people can also see exactly which cuts will be covered as part of the program. And then um, just wanted to throw in some numbers so you all have a sense of what our internal crews are doing. Joe mentioned, you know, we have asphalt patching crews. So those are crews that are um, out there filling potholes every day around the city. Um, we have two asphalt crews that are running every day. Um, year to date, they've filled 2,106 potholes. Obviously, right now, they're focused on um, the parade routes and, and streets adjacent to the parade routes and can't say enough about the work that they do every day. Um, and also our uh, vac truck crews. So we have crews out there flushing catch basins and lateral lines, and they've cleaned 62 catch basins and flushed um, nearly 5,000 linear feet of drain line this year. Yeah, Joe just mentioned I, I should talk about. So we do have some new equipment that's going to be coming online um, probably in March. Um, we have some new pothole patchers, two that have arrived. We have another three that will um, be coming in the next few months, but essentially one per council district. And this is going to allow us to do more permanent patching around the city. So we're very excited about this. I'm excited to get trained on it, learn how it works. Um, but it's just going to be able, you know, we, we do temporary asphalt patching. doesn't last forever. This will, will make it last a lot longer. So we're excited about that. Um, and now I'll move in just to talk a little bit about where we are in terms of our streetlight repair and maintenance program. And I included this map. I've shared it before. But I think it's really important to note that we did um, we did look at NOPD's uh, data about high crime areas when we were figuring out how to sequence our repairs. So I just wanted to um, mention that for everybody to, to be aware of. Um, so right now what we're looking at, we've got about 4,000 outages remaining around the city. All Star is our contract, 4,000 remaining throughout the city. All Star is our contractor. We have Legacy uh, as our contract monitor, their DDE firm. Both are doing phenomenal, but Legacy is basically monitoring and assigning uh, All Star's work throughout the city. Uh, so the information I included on here, um, All Star has repaired now probably close to 2,200 outages um, all around the city. Um, knockdown poles we're dealing with on average five a week, uh, so that is part of their charge around the city. So they've retrieved 100 knockdown poles, reset 237 leaning poles, they've installed 63 new poles. Um, and we've got work underway at 27 sites with Im impact 20, 229 lights. Um, when the contractor first got started, so we in tier one, so again, these are lights that are in areas that have been identified by NOPD as high crime areas and near schools. Uh, there were 2,200 outages um, at the beginning, and now we're down to 269. So they've worked their way, I think, very well um, through those tier one outages. So pleased about their progress. I included some information about where we are with French Quarter outages. Um, they've done, they've re restored 52 outages. Um, some of the lights just needed cleaning. They've replaced some fixtures. Um, we've got about 10 pending outages uh, remaining in the French Quarter. Um, we had some outages around the Superdome and the Smoothie King Center. Um, they've repaired those around the Smoothie King Center. Crews are actually out today in Champion Square. There were five locations um, with outages to require some underground work. So they're hoping to wrap that up in the next couple of days. And the outages around the Superdome are also going to require some underground work. So that's going to take a little longer. That's not out to 4,000, though. I'm sorry? We have 269 remaining out of 4,000. 269 out of, of the, the tier one. The tier, the tier one. Yes. Okay. Tier one. Okay. Total 4,000 outages remaining around the city. Well, of those 269 are in in areas that have been identified as as high crime or near schools. Well, I mean, since you said high crime, uh, uh, allegedly, and you know, people will tell you anything, that there was a uh, a criminal and robbers co convention uh, not too long ago, and they were asked what, what was the next city they wanted to go to, and they said New Orleans because it's dark there. We got to light it up. We we really do. And thank you for starting this effort. But those hot spots, uh, those targeted areas, have to be as important as those major economic development areas. 
Absolutely. And, and, I, and I appreciate that effort. Yeah. We don't want to, we don't want them to bring the, the, the convention in. Mm -mm. Thank Absolutely. Um, interstate outages, we've talked a lot about this. Um, there are a number of outages still remaining on the interstate, but they are making, making progress. Um, I sent you all an update last week. There were 520 outages. They've been able to get some additional outages done um, between I-610 and the CBD. I think they got another 60 done. So we're down to 420. Um, residents will continue to see lane closures um, that are coordinated with DOTD as they uh, continue to make those repairs. And finally, I just wanted to update you a little bit on where we are with traffic signal repairs. As we all know, we have a number of signals that are out around the city. Um, I will mention, so we have an emergency traffic signal repair contract uh, that is in place. All Star is the contractor. We did um, last year put out two, two contracts for advertisement for traffic signal repairs, and we got no bidders. So I think it's important to share that with you and be transparent about that. There is not a whole lot of competition where this work is concerned. So the same contractor that is doing our street light repairs is the same contractor that is doing our traffic signal repairs. So what we're essentially doing now is shifting a crew from doing street light repairs over to help us get a handle on some of the traffic signals that are out. Now with these traffic signal repairs, they all require comprehensive work. Most of these locations require a new cabinet or underground wiring work. And so I put in um, just the, the durations for doing that work. The contractor All-Star is actually out at West End today. Um, there was a pole that was hit. That's what caused the outage there. They expect that's going to be repaired today, and then they will move on uh, down that list following the sequence uh, that I shared with you today. So they have, um, can't say enough about All-Star and Legacy. They've been doing a phenomenal job uh, with, with both uh, streetlights and traffic signal repairs. And that um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Councilmember King. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Sportius. Good morning. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'll say it before I want to say it again. Thank you for your res response times. You have been a breath of fresh air in DPW. Um, you respond to every email and it may not be the answer we want, but it's the it's an answer and that makes a huge difference. And that's something that we can pass on to constituents knowing that their, their, their voices are being heard. So thank you for that. Um, every time I get a chance to publicly thank you, I wanna do so because we publicly admonish the people that don't do us. I think we should do the same thing for those that do. Thank you. Very welcome. Um, I had a, a meeting with the Algiers presidents last night and a couple of questions came up. So they were, they're redundant, please, please forgive me. Um, how are the streets chosen to be fixed? It seems as if certain streets don't get any attention. Some certain streets get attention more often than others. Um, like some streets may get repaired more than once by the other street a couple blocks down is never touched. Um, streets in the cutoff and Aurora Oaks have never been repaired in a long time. Failing streets, um, off the top of my head, Berkeley and Dover for sure, Westchester and a lot of streets in the cutoff um, need a lot of attention and People just want to know what is the process when those how how those streets are selected. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's there's a lot more FEMA funded work um, on the East Bank than there is on the West Bank. We only had two projects, um, West Bank Group A and I think West Bank Group B on on the West Bank that were FEMA funded. So I think there's a lot of activity that people see on the East Bank for that reason. We also do have bond projects. We've had um, we have completed. A number of bond projects on the West Bank uh, in recent years, but for newer projects, um, you know, many of the requests we take through 311. We continue to get requests um, for road repairs, and we have to create a, a basically, essentially, a bond project to do those repairs on the West Bank. And then some, you know, we will meet with you to sort of understand what your priorities are, and that's how we come up with projects. I know there is a lot of work that's needed on the West Bank. And we look forward to, you know, continuing to work with you to, to develop those projects. Yeah. But there is additional, I'm sorry, there is additional FEMA work, um, one additional project on the West Bank that we're And I underway. think uh, Council Member uh, King to just, uh, you know, emphasize on what Sarah was saying. I think it's the opportunity for all the council districts as we move this year into, we have an additional 200 million of uh, bond funds that we have to sell. And I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to sit down with the council districts at, as we've done before, get your priorities a list so we can inject those in the capital project, uh, capital infrastructure program 
and put them on the list for that that next bond sale coming up. Well, echo what Councilman Thomas mentioned earlier. I think it may be I'm not sure who the person to uh, make that decision, but if each councilman to get their own budget capital projects, I think that goes a long way. We kind of have the idea of what streets should be repaired first and what streets had the most need. Um, so just, just I'm not sure who the right person is to talk to about that, but I think that's a great idea forward. Yeah, and I think it, I think it's it's me and Sarah. I mean, you know, I've got capital projects under me, Vince Smith is running that. Uh, me and Vince also run the bond sales and, and putting that package together for bound council and the board of liquidation. So I think this is the perfect timing right now because we do want to sell that other tranche uh, this year. It's a perfect opportunity for us to sit down, get your priorities, put them on the list, uh, calculate those dollars and move them into the next bond. Yeah, we got to get those bonds sold, no doubt yes, about sir. it. Councilmember Harris. I, I had a couple. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Councilmember King's not finished. Uh, 4,800 to go. All right, that's right in front of um, Lakewood Country Club. And it's a two-lane street, but one side of the street is it's on, a, on a lean. And with the additional traffic due to the Bell Chase Bridge, man, construction, that, that street is without a doubt the most traveled street in Algiers. So um, it's, a, it's a huge hazard, 4,800 4, block of the go. So it's two lanes. Like this. I'm sorry, 4,800 block of General, General De Gaulle. General De Gaulle, okay. in front of front of Lakewood Country Club, and, and all there is to notice notify people of the dip is um, Orange Cone. That's a that's a major street, probably the biggest street, most traveled street in Algiers. Oh, you mentioned two asphalt crews, two additional asphalt crews. I think that's a good start. Um, I would say that needs to be more, maybe one in each district. Is there a way we can get more asphalt crews? I would love that. I mean, the goal is to have a crew for every district so that they are very familiar with exactly what's going on in each district. If we had one asphalt crew, one back truck crew, that is certainly the goal. Um, we have a lot of vacancies in DPW, and we are actively trying to hire um, to to expand our maintenance crews. So that that is absolutely the goal. So please direct people our way. Um, we're looking for equipment operators. We're looking for laborers. As I said, we've got a lot of a lot of vacancies in our maintenance department. All right. And my last question is about the streetlights, um, specifically in the French Quarter. There, um, it kind of cleared up. You said that there are 52 outages restored and 10 pending. So is, does that mean that all the streetlights in the French Quarter that were reported out, there's only 10 left? So the city owns streetlights. So we've repaired 52 of them. We have 10 outages that still remain. Some require underground work, some require coordination with energy. But remember there were, um, uh, I can't remember the number, but the five, there were a number of 5G poles, 100, maybe 150, 200 that were installed. And as part of that, um, they had to have lanterns and lighting on those. Um, that has not all been completed. So I, I wanna be clear on that. There's still, I think the lanterns are coming off the production line and you're gonna start to see those going in, but the city owned, I was talking about the city owned streetlights. Thank you, that's all, that's all I have. Council Member Harris. Thank you, uh, Council. Oh, I'm sorry, one more, I'm sorry. They <laughs> call out of Eugene. No, no, no. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Council Member uh, King slash I, Green. I, 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 I have to mention this. I was asked, um, you may get an email from the Algiers President's Council, if you can um, attend the next meeting, uh, February 28th at 6.30 p.m. Um, at the Park Timbers Country Club. They would like to have a DPW representative at the meeting. Absolutely. Thank you. February 28th. Okay. That's a country club meeting, you know. <laughs> I might, I might come to that too. Clubhouse, <laughs> not the country club, the, the park temples, the clubhouse. I'm saying, okay. all right. Oh, I can't come. Uh, don't do that. To, uh, the club out. Don't do that, Freddie. We don't got a lot of country clubs out there. Councilmember Harris. Uh, thank you. I have three pages of questions and two questions from uh, Councilmember Jerusa, who couldn't be here today. Um, I'll ask Councilmember Jerusa's questions first. Okay. Uh, when will the DPW dashboard be ready to publish for public viewing? The DPW dashboard for what specifically? For, I'm, I think he's speaking about, I know we have the roadwork dashboard, yeah. which is glitchy at best, doesn't give information that's updated. It gives you a range of information. Um, he's, I think he wants more in-depth information in that dashboard. 
Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know what we've spoken about. We haven't spoken about that before. I'm certainly happy to talk with him about the kinds of things he'd want to see. Um, but I, I don't think it would be too difficult to have a dashboard which shows, you know, the number of potholes that we've filled, the number of, you know, catch basins that we've cleaned and, and where those locations are. Um, we can certainly explore that. Okay. And what would prevent DPW from publicly displaying all deadlines like NTP work order changes, JIRR deadlines? <laughs> So all, all of the NTPs are public. They are all on roadwork.nola.gov. If you go to the project page for every project that's under construction, it lists, it gives the presentation um, that's given during the pre-construction meeting. It lists the NTP date. All of that information is public. All the presentations include the number of days in the contract. So all of that information is already out there. Okay. What about JIRR deadlines? Are those also that's, on that dashboard? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Work order changes. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, good question. I think, um, you know, we can certainly, I'm not sure yet if they're going to have a public facing element of the Procore construction management software that I talked about, but I think, um, I think that's an interesting thought and I'm certainly willing to look into that because part of what we're so excited about is that, you know, with a plan change, you can see the approval process right there. You can see if it's been sitting or who's holding it up. Um, we can certainly explore whether, whether a public facing um, component of that is possible. Okay, on to my questions. How is the current uh, task order based system been working so far for Camp Street specifically? Yeah, it's a little. It, it's it's working very well on all the, the six projects that I mentioned. Camp Street's a little different because it's it is like a traditional DPW project in that you have you know the number of blocks right there in one space versus two hundred fifty blocks all over the place. So I think it's 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 working very well. Um, it's working very well so far. Okay, and, and we'll need to visit that site soon. So that you want to have a site yeah, visit? Yeah, the next time you sure. visit, just let us know and we'll go with you. Um, have there been any new developments for the newly rescoped East Riverside project? Uh, well, as Joe mentioned earlier, I mean, we have a pause in terms of putting in new work. Um, so nothing, nothing new. Um, but I think, um, I think as we continue to to wrap up projects, get them to substantial completion, show people, you know, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, then we'll have some more confidence in terms of being able to to put out new projects. Okay, um, we've received complaints of residents receiving parking tickets in the neighborhood that's being affected by the DPW zero one eight project around Camp Chestnut Coliseum. Um, et cetera. Has your team finished an assessment to see if parking restrictions and enforcement will be relaxed in that area? So, I mean, I, I certainly am willing to talk to the, the parking administrator about that. It's a little bit challenging because we have construction all over the city and we can't just relax parking enforcement everywhere. Um, but, I, you know, I certainly can have that conversation. Okay. I'm going to move to central city projects Okay, because I live there and because I pass yeah. them every day. Um, the current status of the remaining sidewalk work in the 1700 block of third street do you know the status of that is there any update um i can get you a status on that yeah i think it was supposed to be done by halloween it's now okay it's going to be done by okay. Gras, but nothing has been done um there is um some drainage work happening at LaSalle up third street i haven't seen crews there i pass every day Okay. Can you get me a status on that? Yes. Okay. And moving on down Third Street um, towards Louisiana, I know there's sidewalk work happening, which is a good thing, but we still don't have the uh, finished work around the sidewalk. So if you can get me a status on when that will happen, because we have ramps, but you can't use the ramp because there's a because exhibit. there's the gap. Yeah, yeah, there's a gap there. Okay. Um. I spoke with Captain Nolan, who's the new captain of the second district in Girt Town. Mm -hmm. um, even driving there, it's you can't get in and out. I mean, the roads look like Beirut. It's some of the worst roads that I've seen. She's concerned because response times are delayed because they're, the NOPD fears their cars dipping and losing front ends of their cars. And, and I've seen some cars where they're all jacked up because they've hit those potholes. Can we get temporary pavement or something out there? Um, this is a this is a serious thing because the police need to be able to respond. Absolutely, um, I will look into that. Okay, and, and I can give you the exact blocks. Um, yeah, that would be helpful. I can find out what's going on. Obviously, 
permanent paving and just getting out of there is is what we want yeah um so even i want to give you an update hole, even the pothole or temporary asphalt and we did send this to you and tyra yes. morris on the 20th so i remember that email yeah. i'm also you know happy to meet with the captain just yeah. to sort of provide an update on where we are so she knows yeah i think she would enjoy that and i will say um broadmoor improvement association i was there earlier this week um they would like an update as well so, okay and i think they're going to invite you to the next meeting but they have some concerns although i i know joe when we were out there i said i would release a dove when that work is done in front of the broadmoor um association building and it's done it looks it looks good i mean so good that the plastic is still on the ramps Right. Exactly. That's the fun. Yeah, that, that should be the last thing they take off. Yeah, and I think Council Member Harris to answer your question about the JRRR, uh, the FEMA deadlines. Uh, we've moved those period of performances. Uh, right now it's February 6, twenty twenty four. Okay. Uh, we'll continue to move it when we start uh, releasing new contracts, and we have NTPs for constructions that the project schedules take us till twenty twenty five. I think that FEMA are moving those as we submit uh, contracts for construction. So I'm optimistic that we'll move into 2025 so we can finish most of this work. Too. Yeah, and I'm excited to, for the project manager to come on, the RFP for the project manager. I think that's going to be super helpful. I think oh, that's yes. what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to ask one more question about surfaces. Um, are there any maintenance contracts for poor uh, for poor surfaces, the um, imper the surfaces that pervious. Yeah, we have a cup. We have the one that I mentioned before for the Lakeview alleyways, and then we will be doing some pervious, um, some pervious parking lanes downtown. Okay, there are um, pervious surfaces in um, uh, in and around Hoffman Triangle that mm -hmm. are not being maintained. So I'll get you that information. As so we're well. we talking about on. Um, Galvez? Yeah, I think so. I'll, I'll get you that exact location. Yeah, please do. Okay, great. Turning to street light outages, what's going on with the cabinets? Are people breaking into the cabinets? Is there one? No, that's no. People steal copper wiring. That's yeah. definitely an issue, particularly in the East. But no, we've had, um, there's one in your district. I can't remember which one it is, but um, it's been replaced a couple times. We've had the manufacturer out there. We've had All Star out there, and you know they keep saying nothing's wrong. Yet we have to keep replacing the cabinet. So yeah, I think that's Loyola and Julia. It's not downtown. I I, I can't, it may be magazine um magazine and uh, I can't remember. Okay, but yeah, so it's you know cabinets often require replacements, but you know there there are few that have been problematic and that it keeps happening. So we're still trying to get to the bottom of that. All right. Um, on, on to other outages. Um, Mayor Control has this new violent crime reduction task force and, yes. and Tyrell of 311911 is, is, I guess, coordinating with your office to escalate um, areas where there needs lighting or cars towed, et cetera, et cetera. I asked yes. the question of has the process now changed where Matt from my office or I send you directly requests for tow, et cetera, et cetera. What we're doing now, when we think that it's crime related, we just copy him on it. Is that the process that you want to continue using going forward or? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, please continue to send them to me. You can copy Tyrell, absolutely. Um, and we, we will get them addressed. And have you, um, I mean, I know that there have been cars towed. Yes. Um, what about the street light outages because of this new task force? Have have you identified additional street lights because of this task force? No, I mean we're we're continue. I mean we've been working on this, you know, since we had our contractor in place in August. And as I said initially, we we started focusing on areas that had been identified, um, you know, as crime hotspots. So we're we're continuing that work. Um, as unfortunately as as things happen, we will um, go out and do assessments. There was one that your office had sent over where there was. Um, a, a homicide or a carjacking and we went out and did a nighttime assessment just to understand whether the lighting had been an issue in that area and we we fortunately found that it was actually pretty well lit but we're going to add some additional lighting there so when those things come up we'll continue to approach it that way um i didn't brief on this but i will also mention that we're working very closely with tyrell to be able to um removed um abandoned junk vehicles and yep. so we're using nopd's um 
tow list to be able to do that until we have our junk vehicles contract in place. Yeah, I know that's important, especially around some of the schools where we know there's drug activity in those abandoned cars. We yes. documented it, sent it to your office. And I know that there seems to be some movement for getting these drunk cars taken care of. Yeah, and I think, uh, Council Member Harris, one thing, one of my priorities right now is looking in the 311. I mean, for me, my questions are, and I've asked my staff, uh, okay, if we have a 311 report and I hear residents saying, hey, I've submitted this multiple times, is that clean data in 311? Have we removed those work orders to, so those other work orders can move up the priority list so we can get to them? So that's one thing we're looking at. I'm really considering putting somebody full time on uh, making sure that when we fill a pothole or fix a street light or traffic light, that that data is removed out of 311. So those other residents requests can move up into the queue and get attention. I'm, I'm really uh, suspicious that we've got so many duplicates in that system that at some point it's not clean data and it's not effective as it should be. Yeah, I mean, we know that that's the case. We have people who, who you know, every week are reporting something to 311 and then we're getting the complaint escalating it to you, but it's also sitting there in 311. Right. So I think that's smart. I will say that um, for streetlights, yes. so that is part of our um, contract monitor's responsibility. So I know in that area, they are reconciling, they're closing out the 311 cases, but it's not the case across all of our divisions. Okay, thank you. Um, when a resident reports a streetlight outage that's discovered to be an Entergy light, do you, does your office report that to Entergy? Absolutely. So Entergy, so we have our bi-weekly status meeting with All Star and Legacy. Entergy actually attends that as well. Um, but we coordinate very closely with via, via treatment with Entergy. Okay, great. And my last question, which I never should say that, how's the coordination been between the JIR projects or other projects and All Star to fix streetlights before streets are closed down because of excavation? Yeah, we're still. It's much better than it was. Um, we're we're still working through that because. Um, we're, we're not at a consistent place where, you know, the project managers are identifying, okay, streetlight, the work's been done on this block, it's cleared out enough so that All-Star can actually get a truck in, you know, to get the work done. But it's in, it's improving. Um, one of the things, we have a project manager for our streetlight repair program, and um, I'm going to ask him to start attending a project manager meeting that happens on a biweekly basis just to sort of get a sense of um, the blocks that are that are finishing up. So we're still we're still working on it, still room for improvement, but it's better than it was. Great. And um, I echo what Council Member King says. I mean, it's been night and day working with you, Sarah. I really enjoy our field trips. Joe Thread, I told you I pray for you every single day um, because I, I, you know, I, I know this is a hard job um, and I just want to say thank you publicly. Thank you. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. I, I feel like, you know, we've got some momentum Right now, we're gaining momentum and things are turning around. It's a big shift to turn around, but we're going to continue to work on until we get the satisfaction to the citizens that they, they deserve. That's why we got a Marine. <laughs> right. uh, Council Member Green. I like to start off with the good news. So I want to thank you for the work that Public DPW has done picking up automobiles mm -hmm. in um, District D. The question is to the public, why they keep leaving so many vehicles? They take off the license plate, they take off the, the VIN number and just decide that this is the way to dispose of a vehicle that they don't want anymore. Could you comment on that in terms of what the public should do when they have a vehicle that they want to get rid of? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I don't know why it's it's happening so much, but I think when it it is, yeah, when it does happen, people need to report those to three one one. Right. Yeah. No, I just mean the person who actually owns that vehicle. If somebody wanted to dispose of a vehicle to help you all, what should they do? Because you you're coming around to get the cars. I appreciate it, but they shouldn't be leaving all these cars as an alternative. Yeah, I don't. If somebody wants to dispose of their own vehicle. It's a good question. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> well, it's not just me then. I thought that you could bring it out to Alvin Astor Avenue and one of those guys will always take it. But okay. Yeah, oh, so these are just people who have gotten tired of their vehicles. They take off the VIN number, they take off the license plate, and they leave it on AP Tour or they leave it on some street. And that's it because you don't know whose vehicle it is that they've taken over uh, those two important things. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's something that we'll talk about. In yes. Terms of what we need to do to publicize to the public what they need to do. Look, um, 
I've never really thought about it if you don't sell it and you just want to get rid of it. But we have so many of those, you know. Right, exactly. In most cities, I mean, that's that's junk and it's salvageable metal. In right. most cities, you know, when they're told, they tow them to the salvage yard and they they get money for scrap. So I wouldn't, I would suspect if you legally own a vehicle that you could take it to a scrap yard. I don't know how it works here. Hey, this is my first year on the council. And I'll tell you, I learn things as I go along. I thought that you were going to give me an answer of you all have a, what do, what do you all do with the vehicles? You don't, so you don't sell them for scrap? We have, so we don't currently have a junk vehicles contract. However, we have a selection committee this afternoon and I'm very excited about. Right. Um, so typically we have an abandoned junk vehicles contractor. So when we get um, notification that a vehicle has been left in a location, you know, we have that contractor that will take care of it. Um, and right now, uh, just given the task force, the mayor's task force on crime, we've been using the NOPD's um, tow list to be able to support us until we have our own junk vehicles contractor in place. And then, you know, we have auctions four times a year. It seems like the city could get a couple of dollars of revenue in from that as there's so many vehicles, like they've been I understand that you're going to try to tow about 400 vehicles in the mm -hmm. first quarter. Yes. It's just an amazing amount of money. That's all. But okay. Um, I also want to commend you on signal repairs in District D. Um, when we've had them, it needed to be done at Legion Fields and Gentilly, I-610 and Legion Fields, they got done. So it's important to recognize that. And haven't we haven't had anybody go in there and steal the wires or anything like that so far. Fingers crossed. Knock on some darn wood. It's ridiculous that you could risk getting electrocuted for that small amount of copper wiring that you can't get a lot of money for. So anybody who's doing that, it's a silly, idiotic thing to do. Um, let me ask you a question. The other Yesterday, I'll look this up and you all tell me, why, does, why do we maintain the lights on the interstate under elevated, I mean, on elevated expressways? Yeah, we, we maintain all of the streetlights in Orleans Parish. So, I mean, it's certainly a good question. I think we've kind of talked about this before and, you know, maybe there should be some supplemental funding provided by the state to do that. But yes, we're responsible for all of them. All right, I'd like to put in a request that you all um, explore asking, especially since the state is saying that they have this money to spend this extra money. Um, well, attach, a, we fis attach a fiscal note to it in terms of how, so we'll know how much it is. Right. So and this is the first time Council Member Green has mentioned this. How, how much is, is the pass through? Uh, you know, we have a lot of pass throughs uh, uh, from the state from criminal justice to lighting. So attach a fiscal note to it. Maybe we can negotiate with their excess, uh, especially their fund balance, especially for the next few years. Maybe we could get into how much money it will help us with that or underwrite that. Right. Or just do it. Right now, the work that's being done on Elysian Fields, the stretch that is state-owned is being done with state dollars. I mean, yes. So just do it. Just decide that they're going to repair it. The reason I brought that up now is because you all are here. But on yesterday, I um, at the corner of Esplanade and Claiborne Avenue, state troopers had blocked off the street because they were repairing the street light there because it's a state thoroughfare. And so we have a confusing relationship with the state sometimes, and we have a relationship that we may need to look at in terms of why in certain instances on state-owned thoroughfares, we do the maintenance, and then at other times, the state does it. I would like to see the state does it. At Esplanade and Claiborne, the state troopers were blocking off the street because they were repairing the, the um lights or either installing new lights mm -hmm. I, I should say and it happens on they might have been installing new lights right yeah but i guess i use that as an example not to knock it because i'm glad it got done but it's an example of the state using its resource because that's a state thoroughfare but then right above it the city has to maintain those lights and we just don't have the resources we have a lot more pressure on our city budget than does the state and the state talks about the fact that they have additional resources available i like to look into that and see what we can do and I will help out, but certainly um, any council member's office can help to put in a request and just see where it goes in terms of the state maintaining its state thoroughfares. But that includes under it too. It includes those areas that we see the unhoused population and we, for example, this morning we're cleaning up and thank you, sanitation, I didn't mention that, but doing that regular cleanup, 
but we're cleaning up under a state thoroughfare. I know, and, and the state and is a cost, responsible it's for, for some of the cleanup of the right. ramps of so the state it, highways. I think that it's time for us to maybe look in some instances not to be adversarial and to those who know we have a great relationship with our delegation. And I will mention it to our delegation, but this is a public meeting, so I'm asking us to look at it. Publicly, I'm asking us to look at it, and then I'll also ask the um, the state to consider relieving the city of that responsibility some way or the other so that we can attend to the many, many other responsibilities that we're going to have as an urban area that aren't going to be had in other areas. I, th I, think, I think, think that's fair. It's fair. I think you make a really good point, and I can try to quantify the number of outages, you know, on an annual basis that we do repair on the interstate and sort of how much that amounts to. Could you talk about the vacancies that you have in DPW and how many there are and how someone fills a job? Yeah, I think um, we have um, the last data that I looked at, we have about 50 vacancies and there are vacancies across all of our divisions, but um, primarily we're looking to fill vacancies in our maintenance division. Um, that also includes our traffic signal shop for some of the internal repairs that we can do to traffic signals, includes our sign shop. Um, in our maintenance division, um, we need laborers, we need equipment operators or laborers on our asphalt crews, equipment operators, um, you know, for dump trucks, for those new pothole patchers that I mentioned, um, for back trucks. So um, we are actively hiring and, and certainly encourage um, anybody to take the civil service exam and submit an application. Every job pays at least $15 an hour, right? Yes. Right. Every job has health and Full benefit, and it includes uh, property management of uh, our equipment maintenance division, parks and we're hiring in all departments and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I bet the Department of Public Works will train people if they join the staff yes. to learn some of this equipment. And encourage upward mobility, of course, in all of those in all of those positions. And we do, in addition to that, we do have um, positions open for project managers. So really, all across the division, the the department. I just like to put it out publicly. I know that we're filling some of the jobs, but oh, it is frustrating to have jobs available like that that pay fifteen dollars an hour with benefits to have the vacancies, including laborers, and then to have some people say that there's no jobs out there. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It needs to stop being said. There are a lot, a lot of jobs with the city, and we need to fill them. And the last thing that I'll say, um, and just like Councilman Woman Harris, I have an opportunity to say. I have one more thing to say after that. I'm <laughs> joking. I'm um, finished with this last question. Well, two things. <laughs> one is that I just want to know. It's always going to be one more. I just want to encourage you that when a job stops and it's going to be a little while, I know that we put it on NOLA ready yes. and things like that. A little flyer to the block is a helpful thing. Just so the people in the block know, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples, but a flyer in a block helps out. Absolutely. And I will, I, I, I imagine you're probably talking about Milneyberg. Um, but yes, under the new contracts, we do have specific language around notifications and the responsibility for the contractor in terms of putting those out every 30 days right. um, on a block. So yeah, I'm certainly interested in- But if it stops. Because, for example, yeah. the Milne Bird block to which we refer has been more than 30 days that it stopped. Or maybe there's something going on that the people can't see. Are we 6,300 music? Yeah, 6,300 yeah. music. So the good news, I, th I think we have reached an agreement with the contractor on that. So I expect, um, I don't, I'm going to get you a time on and when work's going to resume. All right. And last thing, and this is actually the last thing. Do me a favor, Mr. Threat, write down these blocks. 1,900 block of North Roman. 2100 block of Bartholomew. I want the people who are watching to hear that I'm asking. 6300 block of music. And the first block of Louisa at Florida Avenue. I just forget the 100 block, but it's north of Florida Avenue. Help me with those. I'll just leave it at that. You go by and you'll right. see what it is. Yeah, we'll come out and take a look. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say my comments. Uh, uh, to the end because we want to uh we don't want to be labor and many of our citizens have been here for a long time uh but there's an issue that's not on the agenda that maybe we can set the table here if we can think about it and next time it'll be an agenda item or maybe we just maybe we need to have a meeting about it specifically i, I remember when 18 wheelers were a major issue in central city yep. lower garden district 
when the Camp Street ramp used to go down from the Pontchartrain uh, Expressway uh, into that community. And a lot of the hardship it placed on those homes uh, in terms of cracking the foundations. Uh, remember when we uh, did a lot of work uptown and they started to deal with the buses uh, and the uh, large trucks and larger traffic because of the impact it had on property and, and homes. Well, we have a lot of issues, but it, 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 it's almost like we have, uh, this is the 18 wheel of Daytona now uh, in, in our city. And now that they can't go into certain communities uptown that would bring them closer to the port, uh, now they have to follow that those exit ramps, uh, top of Tulis now to get to the convention center of the port, they seem to be staging all over the city. Uh, they seem to be staging in areas like New Orleans East. They seem to be staging in parts of Gentilly. And the same type of hardship that they placed on those residents and those other communities and those, their homes and cracking the foundations, uh, cracking uh, the roofs and the homes, they're doing the same thing. Uh, I, I want you guys to think about how we begin to attack this and deal with it. How do we put out, I don't know why the city doesn't take advantage of, I don't want to say scare tactic, but putting people on alert. What's wrong with having a press conference saying, hey, dumpers, we're coming after you. We might not even come after you, but at least we're making them think we're coming after you. Hey, 18-wheeler drivers that are destroying, you know, you know, crowd is not your staging area. Bullets are not your staging area. The Legion Fields is not your stage, staging area. And we're going to have a blitz of everybody that's illegally parked. We're coming out one day with the big tow truck, the big Mac tow truck, and tow your truck, so hurry up moving. What's wrong with us doing that? Nothing. And I, I mean, we do, we do do sweeps. Oh yeah. yeah. We, we do yeah. do this. I mean, when you know about it and we do issue citations and they're pretty hefty, they're $500, yeah. no. you know, for a citation, but we need to do more. But they're like, catch me when you can right now. So let's think about that because I want my next meeting. Okay. I, I want to have an, even if maybe my colleagues, we need to specifically do a special meeting on it. Okay. It, they're proliferating through communities that are pretty stable. All right. And I, I want to have some answers on that and an initiative to how we attack. Okay. Yeah. And what I'll do is uh Monday, you know, it's Monday, you'll be gone. Maybe the next next mayor's meeting. I'll bring it up to communications director. And and uh as we begin to attack this 311 list, whittle it down, address issues that citizens have complaints about. I've also put on notice to talk to some of my colleagues because I agree in many cases that if we keep meeting on stuff that never happens, we can be stopping work from where people could be meeting. Could, instead of meeting all the time, they could be working. Right. So, But if we can start attacking some of these lists and so where we're addressing these issues, uh, I'm going to make a move to my, because uh, I'm not going to lie to y'all. I was elected 13 years before. I've been in more meetings in this one year than I was in, no, for real, for real, than I was in 13 years. It's a lot. I, I would rather be working with my colleagues, planning, looking at zoning, how we attack these issues. Yeah, or have the meetings out in the but field. I have the out meetings. The street. So, you know, give us some stuff where we're attacking it. And I'm going to make a motion that at least maybe this committee meeting be uh, every other month uh, instead of every month, but showing the citizens that we're attacking the issues they bring to. Bring yeah, to. I appreciate that, Council Member, because, you know, really my time is more valuable to me right now out there in the streets right. getting work done. Right. We, we were, uh, Ms. Karen uh, uh, Kirsten, and, and thank you for waiting, uh, Ms. Kirsten. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Karen Kirsting. I live in the Marleyville area. As you know, I've been here several times to talk about the ongoing um, debacle, which is the street repair in our neighborhood. <laughs> Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't first say that if it wasn't for Joe and Sarah, it would probably be a lot worse. They've been a tremendous help. But 
we, we still need more help. And today I brought some visuals. Um, this sign, whoops, this sign was placed in front of my house on November 14th. The zip tag has um, degraded and it's been sitting in the mud. No work was done a month prior to the sign being put up and no work has been done in our street since. The next day on the 15th of November, a letter was posted at my house saying that they would um, let us know if they were gonna do work that would impact our driveway. Well, the same day they put a, this is hard rock, they drove a surveyor stick in the city property so that I can't get into my driveway. And it's been that way for coming on four months. We've had no work done. We have a sandy, rutted, muddy mess as a street. That's the 4200 4, block of Vincennes. Behind me, which is a Drennan project in the 4300 block of State Street Drive, they paved the street here, well, here, and the sidewalk is up here. There is no way it meets ADA regs. There is no way that a little car will be able to get up into the driveway, and they're gone. They haven't been there in weeks, and um, we're wondering, will we ever get a paved street? So now the soil is subsiding and the sidewalks that are left are kind of tilting into the old roadbed. Um, and then lastly, you know, for the sake of comedic value, um, we discovered that they haven't connected the drains properly and a snake got in through the storm drain and got into my neighbor's drain line and the plumber had to extract a snake this large. So obviously these uh, workers are not doing the job properly. Um, I would beg DPW and the city to please invoke you know, either liquidating damages on these characters, um, call their bond and bring in somebody else. I mean, I'd rather take prison labor right now doing this work than some of these knuckleheads from Hard Rock and Drennan. Um, again, these two people are saints, you know, for trying to make the world better, but we need more help. And I thank you, you know, for giving me a chance to express my opinion. Uh, uh, well, you bring something to mind uh, in council members. I think what Ms. Kersing said, so we know that there's, there's prep work when, you, when you're doing infrastructure. You have to prepare the street. You have to prepare the roadway, right? Those streets are level. They're graded to a certain level so that you can come back with your concrete or your asphalt overlay. So when it sits for so long or when they don't complete it timely, what happens to the grade work? If you don't go back and regrade it, or, or if you haven't finished it, then that's a whole level of design and engineering that has to happen to, to maintain the integrity of it. So have we thought about that? Absolutely, and they have to regrade it and they have to pass a pre-poor inspection, so yes. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, Mr. Neely. I wanna apologize to Council Member Green. I, I wasn't trying to, you know, um, make that comment seem the way it came off. Um, and just so you know, he knows that if there was ever an asset, and him and I had a conversation, I said, hey, man, that young man uh, is an asset. If nothing else, he's trying to help. We, I, we, we had that conversation. Absolutely. And he was like, absolutely. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to working with you. Um, so special consideration is being put toward high crime areas. But based off that comment, something isn't adding up, right? Because with that being said, District E should be well lit. The comments nowadays are that District E has all the crime. District E is, has this. District E has that. Well, we should be lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> first and everything, if it was, if their lives was true, we should, we, we should be first. <laughs> right. So um, also, Ms. Sarah, um, it was stated at the October 27th council meeting that the high-rise lighting down to the Morrison curve and the bullet overpass and the 510 ladder will be back on by the end of 2022. Do we have another update on that? So yeah, so, so that was their goal. And obviously we wanna get the lighting repaired as quickly as possible. I will get you a time frame um, from the contractor. Obviously their, their focus right now is continuing to reduce the number of those um, 2,200 that are in tier one. Um, they're focused on you know, areas where there are um, gonna be parades coming up. Um, and, uh, yeah, but I'm going to get you an update on those lights. Okay. They did, they did begin their investigations, um, starting at Louisa. Um, so they are, they are looking at them, assessing them, make sure they have all the supplies and stuff that they need to do the repairs. So I know that, 
um, has actually happened. Okay, appreciate it. Um, also, um, one of the tall hundred foot lights over at Reed, one of those is still out as well. Um, another thing too is, um, Mr. Joseph, um, I spoke to you earlier about um, the curbs for the Briarwood project. Can you give? Okay, okay, appreciate it. All right. Um, also, it was stated that the tow trucks are down to grab the abandoned cars across the city. So we have um, the city has its own fleet of tow trucks. That is, um, we have a number of them that are down. The last I checked a couple of days ago, we had six tow trucks online. Um, in addition to that, we have our junk vehicles contract, which we have a selection committee today. So that'll be coming back online. And then we are using NOPD's tow list to help supplement where we can. But I think you know, if residents report a vehicle that needs to be towed, part of the delay is that our fleet um, is not what it once was. And that's because, um, you know, aging fleet, a lot of them are are off at repair. Um, and then we've got eight tow trucks that are on order, but they are not arriving until 2024 just because of supply chain. So what will be a full efficient fleet? Uh, if we had, I would say 15, 16 tow trucks. And you say how many are down? Right now we have six, so I think there are eight or eight, seven or eight that are at uh, the equipment maintenance division for repair. Okay, and we have how many cars that are being stolen on a regular, Councilman Thomas? Several thousand. At least about, yeah. <laughs> okay. The simulation um, for the year is several thousand. Okay. Um, okay, that's... Oh, okay. Um, also, um, there's a dump truck that's parked on the corner of Hain and Briarwood. Uh, it's currently on a flat and it's leaking oil into the storm drains. Um, environmental hazard, um, seafood hazard, <laughs> any okay. kind of hazard you could think of. You know, being a former diesel mechanic, I know the gripes of, you know, having this exposed to the environment. Um, also, can we look into getting no truck route signs? You say you're a former mechanic? Yes, I'm a diesel mechanic. Need some work right now. <laughs> he, he, he working for us, Joe. We need you better pay him a lot of money if you want to take him. So can we look into the no truck route signs? Okay, I appreciate it. That's all I had. I appreciate you guys. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Kelly. <laughs> Good morning. I'll be really swift just as a nosy neighbor. I do want to say, Councilman Green, that usually as a square um, resident, I would usually uh, return my license plate into the DMV and I would usually call for Bridge House to pick it up. Text, text right off. I don't just drop it off on mural. I will donate it and turn in my license plate. So that's always an option that we could share with our residents. Um, I think my second piece is I would like to bring to the attention um, the staging areas that DPW are using with, throughout the community and the maintenance of those areas. Um, we do want to take and keep in mind the residents who live in that immediate community. We have one um, on Bundy Road. Uh, I think I sent the email over to DPW. It is horrendous. It's uh, affecting quality of life. Um, I, I sent that over to DPW. I would like you all to look at that. I would like also for the city to also um, consider when they put up those fences to possibly erect some green privacy fencing around that to give the neighbors back just a sense of respect for their community. Um, so I did send you over an email, um, particularly um, highlighting that property on Bundy. And I would like you all to um, take a look at that property and also consider purchasing some private, some green privacy fences like we see in Metairie, like when they're doing when they're doing work and they, they have these spaces that they hold these areas, give us some respect, you know, give, put that green fencing up so that we can have um, the, the proper quality of life while you all do that work. And the, the state needs to do the same thing. We've talked to them about uh, with their staging areas. Uh, you know, you 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 tear up the they tear up the landscape. We want them to do the work, but at least replace the landscape back and the beautification back. That should be part of the contracts. Yes, thank you. And I think my very last thing is that um, fifty uh, Christian Lane. They did the contractors there did a phenomenal job. They swept through, but they did leave some incomplete work. Just maybe like one area, and have not come back to pick up. I don't know it's like a, um, like an area where they hold all of the cement. 
So that's still there. And as Christian Lane, you will find it nearest 5540 Christian Lane. So I just want to put that on your radar. And again, I want to thank you all for all of the hard work that you do because you're always so responsive. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Parker. Three things. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. District Econs, I mean, District Econs, someone, thank you. Oh, man. All right. You mentioned out of Florida was doing some work. And you mentioned All Star. Who can I contact to uh, to find out what black contractors they're dealing with? You mean who their um, who their DBE contractors? Yes, that be. should all be public information. We can get that to you. Okay. Um, and I will also mention that for our streetlight contractors, so we have a contract monitor in place. It's a one point nine million dollar contract, and it is a DBE legacy. Miss Miss Parker, you. you uh, I always tell people it's amazing how God and energy work. Uh, the last segment that I'm going to deal with is uh, I want to have a, uh, a special meeting of this committee at some point, especially before, before we start the next round of work, uh, just on who the contractors are, who they are. It, we'll go back the last four years, maybe, the work that they've gotten. What current contracts are they working under? But not just there. Who are their subs and other companies that are part of that contract? Who are their DBEs? For the DBEs, we say we have a lot of companies that say they're DBEs, but they don't have any Black employees that work for them. They don't have any Black subs that once they get a contract, they don't reach out to any other minority workers. I want to know who those uh, uh, African American or DBE contractors are, what work they've gotten over the last four or five years, who have they worked with from design to actual uh, contracting, and who are the subs and smaller contractors locally that they historically work with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you. And what we're going to do is we're going to, I don't know if we can legally do it. It may not be binding to stop them from working. But those prime contractors, as well as those minority contractors, we're going to grade them. Thank you. Two other things, and uh, Dow, uh, Morrison and Downman, the curb there. I'm an old man. I still do my walk, even if it's in the east. And uh, we have a big problem there with the curb. Uh, Morrison and Downman. And also, could you check on Wales, uh, well, Donman to Wales, the street from Donman to Wales. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I, 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 four years, and you all have to hurry up and put that together. Every prime, uh, every DBE that has done work, previous uh, work that they've gotten, current contracts that they have, and who are they working with? Who's invoicing them? Yep. who's invoicing the city. And I want to take a look at the, their, their individual projects to see how those projects rate in terms of on time and on budget. Okay. I will tell you, we have um, on the Roadwork site, there is um, a page, I think it says who's involved, that does list all of the prime contracts just that have been involved in the entire joint infrastructure program. I, but we'll take it a step I, further. I don't, I don't just want the prime. Understood. Uh, yeah, I, I want to know who those minority contractors are and if they're hiring people from the community, mm -hmm. and if they're, you know, you can walk around saying, I'm a DBE, I need work. But if you're not hiring anybody from the community, you're not doing any different from the people that we complain about. And yep. then I want to know, who are you contracting with? Are so, you going back and giving that work to the other primes that, uh, that are you working with? Or are you reaching out within your community doing business with other local and minority contractors? We're going to break them down. But I mean, it definitely has to be an element of us for the program management office moving for, forward in this next billion dollars of wave three and four, you know, and I've queried, I've always had those questions myself when I go out and find one DB contractor floating around five or six different prime contractors. And I know for a fact there's other concrete workers and asphalt workers in this city. So I, I want to, like the mayor says, share the. Before we do that, I want to know the history 
of right. the ones who have gotten the work, prime as well as DBE, from design to contract work, to construction work, from design to construction. Who are they? Mm -hmm. How many contracts have they worked on the last four years? How much have they built the city for? And who do they historically work with? And who do they employ? Now, some of that stuff, I don't know if it's, it's illegal or not, but if you're working on a public contract, we ought to be able to get that. Supplier diversity is tracking all okay. that. Yeah. But what we want, though, that, that information isn't going to be in the dark anymore. And I mean, if it's on the next public works agenda, whatever you desire, I'll look, bring supplier look, diversity. Y'all put that information together for, for me. It's not just about the primes. It's about those local minority and DBE contractors and who are they working with? What contracts have they worked on? Who works for them? And who do they contract with in terms of subs when they have the ability to go partner with somebody or get somebody to do the, the work to maintain the contracts they have? I want to know it all. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything left? We Any have, online comments? Yes, we have one online comment. This is from Jermaine Lewis with the Tall Timbers Extension. Jermaine says, with over 12 potholes or drainage problems on Telus Drive, when will we see some work being done? This section of the city has not had any improvements in over 20 years. I invite Public Works to take a look. I'd be glad to send them the pictures I have. And that's it for the public comments. Talton. Oh, can I mention? No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm trying to hurry me down. Go ahead. Two things, because I got a couple messages I want to share. So if, as far as abandoned junk vehicles, I, I did get a message from one of my team members that it is revenue generating. So they actually pay us for those vehicles because they'll scrap it. Um, and then the other thing in terms of the street lights on the interstates, I'm told that it is state law. And that is why we maintain them. I'm going to look into that further and I'll share with you what I find. That's a law that we need to change. Agreed. If they maintain under it, they can maintain the lights too. They have the revenue, but I don't really know why we ever let that law go through. But I understand they have a majority. So, all right. Thank you. Thank Such you. Machines. Holding council members Thomas's machine at his request. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll send you additional. The one thing I didn't mention that I should have. So the first one I have to do is 